Clients are looking for trusted advice and a sense of stability as they navigate the new normal. And by using Bill.com, accounting firms can free up more time for valuable strategic advisory services by helping clients shift their accounts payable process online. Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor, Bill.com, later in the episode. He agonized over getting this loan. He did take the loan. He said he put it in a separate bank account. He plans to maintain his payroll. And he understands that this loan was intended to help companies that were going to have to shut down or suffer major losses or lay their employees off. But there's nothing in the program to differentiate his company that's financially stable and a company that is operating at 50% capacity or anything, right? And so regardless of the stimulus, his company could have probably weathered the storm, he thinks, possibly. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Accounting Suite. Accounting Suite is cloud accounting software that acts like a customizable ERP system. It lets you start out with just the features you need today, and in the future, as your business grows, you can easily add Accounting Suite extensions to give you the features you need. A major strength of Accounting Suite is its robust set of inventory management tools to track inventory levels, orders, sales, and deliveries from anywhere at any time. Accounting Suite has an extension for multi-channel online sales. After connecting your online marketplaces, Accounting Suite will download all your transactions for you to approve prior to entry into the accounting system. It's similar to working with bank feeds. Accounting Suite is offering Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners 50% off forever by using the promo code CAP underscore 50 underscore 2020. To take advantage of this exciting offer and to learn more about how Accounting Suite offers an upgradable path for your firm and company's future, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash ASuite. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash A-S-U-I-T-E. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by BQE Core. As firms everywhere are positioning themselves to work remotely, BQE Software is committed to supporting you and your employees during this critical time. BQE's core products operate 100% on a native cloud platform that's uniquely able to help you in your efforts to embrace remote work while maintaining your productivity. In response to the impact that COVID-19 has had on your firm and your clients' businesses, the team at BQE has let us know that Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners will now receive three months of BQE Core for free with an annual subscription package purchased on or before May 31st, 2020. To learn more, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash core. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash C-O-R-E. Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. And we're recording on Saturday. Normally we do Fridays, uh, at least during quarantine, but we are are recording Saturday because yesterday we talked with Mike Whitmire from Flowcast. We did an interview about his new book, and that is coming out as a bonus episode right after this one. So um, everybody be sure to check that out. David learned a little bit about uh, the financial close in the mid-market. Yeah, it was a uh, eye opening for me to understand <laughs> the uh, the difficulties that exist um, in that space. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's really hard to like just digest things and comprehend things uh, with the news all week and then uh, work and Zoom calls. I'm starting to hit that limit, and I'm actually looking forward to us doing the show today because I just I had a breath now, and it's Saturday. You're my only person I'm talking to today. It's amazing. Oh, that's great. Well, I'm I've, I've not you. So you're you're not talking to your family. <laughs> You just well, not through Zoom or uh, oh, you know. right, right, got it. Like, yes, yeah, Zoom fatigue is a really big thing. I know, and I, I suffer from it too. Um, I, I actually, there was a great article that I tweeted out. Uh, I'll find the link for that. Stick it in the show notes. But uh, you know, one of the recommendations. And there's a lot of these you know, recommendations, uh, but this one's a good one. Is schedule five, ten, fifteen minutes in between all of your Zoom meetings because otherwise you're not going to have the break. And you get more of a break when even when even if your schedule is completely packed in an office because you're walking from one room to another, right? You're getting up, you're standing, you're moving around. There's intros uh, in these physical meetings, whereas with a Zoom, you're just constantly going from one to another, and you're not moving from your chair. That's really good because I mean, because right now my my experience is like no Zoom meetings are starting on time either. So maybe people should just build 15 minutes. That give people 15 minutes to get to the meeting on time. Yeah. Just build that in their schedule. Zoom should just make that a feature. Like you just can't attend meetings. That's back to back. Calendly, these calendar apps almost all have it. Um, And I think actually with 
Google Calendar, you can go into the settings and you can, there's a setting called like quick meetings or something where it gives you like a 10 minute buffer uh, at the end of every meeting. So it makes an hour meeting a 60 minute, or it makes a 60 minute meeting a 50 minute meeting. And it makes a 30 minute meeting a 25 minute meeting. Check that out. So there's some tools to to get some control over it. All yeah. right. I'll, I'll give that a try. Uh, so how, how are you holding up, David? I think I'm good. I'm holding up fine. Um, I'm having Wi-Fi problems though. Oh no, that's the worst. I'm, I'm starting to uh, like like I, I found an article about uh, people working from home and their connectivity issues. It has some interesting data in it. But I, I'm almost starting to feel like COVID's killed more routers than it has people. Possibly because every time <laughs> I turn around, somebody's like, "Oh yeah, I had to go buy a new router and upgrade my uh, router situation over and over again." Yeah, so I'm going to actually... try to switch to a mesh network. I guess so. This will be a project I'll update next week, maybe. Let me know which. Do you know which mesh you're going to use? I have no idea. I, I've been putting this off. Like, I have three routers in the house, you know, in three different parts of the house, and you know. So I, I, and it's always been a little bit of a headache, but not enough a headache to fix. But now I think my main router is starting to see its day. Yeah. Well, I, I highly recommend you go check out the wire cutter and just search for mesh, mesh wireless on wirecutter.com because all their stuff like is really well tested. Uh, I personally have a Google router like the one that they sell it's a mesh network and that always worked great for me so it, it makes a big difference when you're walking around the house like you don't lose your connection you get good coverage everywhere and yeah. you can always print right because that's yeah. the problem i go to the back of the house and then i'm not in the same network as the printer and then i have to walk <laughs> to the front of the house and switch networks and it's always yeah, yeah. dance so yeah i'm looking forward to some it's of the benefits it. from that okay it, that's it's, it's worth it. i mean i'm gonna do it but yeah i saw some interesting stats about the uh, other people working from home so a lot of it's connectivity like um 16 of people um are dry or have an issue every day Ooh. and 22 percent are having an issue weekly and 15 percent monthly just connectivity issues and yeah. people are uh, comparing their survey from March, uh, I'm sorry, October 2018 to March 2020. People reporting good signal on their cell service is increased from like 36% to 40%. Right. But people reporting excellent or very good has dropped from 40 to 29. Hmm. And then for people with reports of bad signals or no signals or very bad have all increased. So people are struggling with not only their connectivity at home, but even just their phone cell service. And then the other graph that I thought was really interesting is, oh, disinfecting of your phone. How uh, how often do you um, disinfect your cell phone? Like never before this, but I've done it maybe two or three times <laughs> since quarantine. Okay. So Americans are answering- and I know they're disgusting. I know phones are disgusting apparently. Because we're touching them all the time, right? Yeah, and that's what I've always understood too. It's it's worse than bottom of your shoe, I guess. So I'm like, oh, oh, oh well. But yeah, a 15% have never done it once, um, but now 35% are doing it every day. Oh, and an amazing amount, 14% are doing it every time they return to their home. So when they get home, they're disinfecting their phone every single time. Enough about you and me, David. I want to know how our accountants doing overall. And you know, I love stats, right? So every time I get a survey. I'm always so excited. And Smart Vault came out with this really great survey that Gabrielle Fontaine, Jane uh, Aylwin, and Don Brolin did for them. And it came out this month. And it's all about how accountants and accounting firms are handling COVID-19. How is it going for them? And one of the really interesting takeaways, the key takeaway from this is that firms that already had at least one cloud system in place prior to COVID-19 fared far better than firms that did not have any cloud systems in place. Kind of, you know, we knew we <laughs> yeah. knew this, right, intuitively. <laughs> but now we've got data to support it. And and this is a great report. Check it out. Link is in the show notes. Um, it is so detailed. And, uh, you know, there's like a before and after analysis. One of the questions up front is prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, how prepared would you say your firm was for remote work? And surprisingly, 29% said our team already worked 100% remote. And this is a survey of 1,100 accountants in 18 countries, by the way. So this is a good survey, like good sample size. 29% already worked 100% remote. 35% had team members who were enabled to work, work remote when needed. So actually almost like two-thirds, right? Uh, I have to do the math in my head. Yeah, two-thirds were already set up for this. But the other third were, were not. They had... Um, some systems and documents able to access remotely, or uh, the 7.2 percent of firms that like are not prepared at all, no systems or documents from home, like they're 
really struggling. Um, I took somebody who has a has, has bigger firm here in Tucson, and uh, basically the way he made it seem is any any of the or departments that have kind of moved forward with technology, like those departments, those people were able to work at home. But as a total firm, you can't do 100% because there's just some parts. They had to be in the office still. They still have to physically go to the office because those parts of the business just have not modernized for whatever reason, right? Mm-hmm. And so I, I can imagine if your whole firm hasn't modernized, this is a big struggle. Yeah. And and there's some insight in this report as to like what specific technologies seem to have mattered the most in this shift to working from home. Online client portal access is a big differentiator. The most successful firms, 80% of the most successful firms in this crisis have an online client portal. Only 55% of the least successful do. And and this success or failure is self-rated. So accountants were asked, how well is your firm handling this transition to remote work? So, uh, and then we're correlating that with what apps they have. So online client portal access is a big one. Uh, e-signature as well. 59% of the most successful firms have e-signatures, whereas only 34% of the least successful firms have it. Uh, another one, both online portal and e-signature, the successful firms double the rate have that over half have both of those and only a quarter about of the least successful firms have both and the same thing actually teleconference might be the biggest difference because it's it's almost half for the most successful who can teleconference or do video meetings like zoom or skype the least successful firms only 21% of them have that capability i mean it makes sense right if you it's you're not just working from home you have clients that are stuck at home as well. Yes. And so if you need to exchange data with them and you don't have a system to do it, like what are you doing? I mean, actually, that'd be great if somebody wants to call us and leave us a voicemail. I would love, but those people usually don't listen to our show, right? The people that are not, <laughs> you know, but because I'm like, what are they doing? If you don't have the digital tools set up to get documents from your clients, like are you, they driving yeah. to your office? Are you meeting them somewhere? How is this happening? They set it down and you go and pick the pile up um, off the sidewalk. A good chunk of firms are still going into the office, believe it or not. And there's some data in here to to support that. Okay, so 8.2% of firms are currently still accessing the office as normal, still going into the office despite everything. And 22% of firms, the clients and team have access, but they're reducing in-person appointments. 27% of firms, only team members are accessing the office, so no clients. Clients are all virtual. And then 42% of firms, all the team members are working remotely and client interactions are all virtual. Uh, And then 1.4% of firms have closed down operations completely. So actually, the the majority of firms are still accessing the office, either entirely or in part. Do you think if it wasn't for PPP and the loan situations, because tax season kind of got delayed, do you think it'd be less? Like People would have kind of taken a little bit more of a step back and... Just stayed at home and oh, yeah. opted out. Well, yeah, I think the tax tax season and PPP together, you know, create this really difficult situation. I mean, you, you know, look at an accounting firm office in the summer; <laughs> it's like it's dead in the month of you know July, right? Yeah, it was just not a not a good time. So, like, not only do you have the compression of tax season uh, getting extended, which doesn't really actually reduce any of the pressure because of the difficulties of working remote. And then you have PPP and all these loan things and all this advisory stuff that has to happen all at the same time, just makes it really hard to actually fix any of these problems. So if you didn't have the cloud accounting app set up, it's not like you were going to get them implemented during this time. Like I, I really, I'd be willing to bet that very few of, I, of these I you know, implementations to, were happening. Almost four weeks ago now, I, I talked to, um, right when the lockdowns all started, I, was, I talked to somebody at Right Networks. And apparently, Right Networks does, um, they have like a full outsourced IT service. So if you're an accounting firm, Right Networks will just take over everything for you. Uh, set up VPMs, make you virtual, um, whatever you take your servers from your house and put it on their servers, whatever, whatever you have, not house, sorry, but your office, right? Um, and my understanding is he, uh, basically he said they're busier than they've ever been. Like immediately their phone started ringing mm-hmm. off the hooks because people who've been putting this off, <laughs> you know, for a decade are, yeah. are in panic mode. Cause they're like, oh my God, I have to work from home now. And I still have a server running underneath my desk that I've never access set up for. VPN or remote access. Well, and this survey backs that up, David. There was another question. Do you think the COVID-19 pandemic will change the way accountants do business forever? 
And 62% said yes, more firms and clients will be open to working together remotely. Only 7% said that things will go back to normal or the way they used to be. Then the rest like say it's too early to tell or they don't know. But 62% say we're going to have more remote work as a result of this. I'm, I'm, I'm really surprised that, that it's not a higher number than 60 that think this is like it, it's not going to go back. I just don't. Well, I think, I, I think the number that really st- sticks out to me is that only 7% say that it's going to go back to the way it used to be. Uh, man. I guess you always have that five to seven percent. That and every like, they're always just going to be that end of the curve there. That just, there's no, they're going to go back to that old way. But yeah, I, I'm so I'm surprised it's not eighty five percent or in full agreement. Like yeah, this is n- never going to be the same. Well, you know, uh, uh, it's a conservative profession, <laughs> but forty five percent of all the respondents do say that more technology, more cloud is going to be a thing going forward. And then 30% say increase in remote working. So interestingly, the the percentage who say that there's going to be more advisory as a result of this, more advisory services, the successful firms, it was 11% of those respondents said that there would be more advisory after COVID-19. Only 4% of the least successful firms said that. So clearly the successful firms are bullish on the advisory services. Well, partially because they have, they possibly have systems in place to manage the and automate some of the work processes and connect remotely, where they can focus. Now they have energy to left to focus on advisory, and they're doubling down on it, right? So yeah, and when that's if you ask me, PPP is not just a compliance exercise. There's a ton of advisory going on with PPP from which bank to use for how to do the calculations, for how to use the money, for how to get forgiveness. I mean, this is a ton of advisory work that's happening right now. Yeah, I mean, even uh, Accounting Web had an article from somebody from the ARCP talking about how you can um, uh, help your small business clients beyond just the PPP. There's the EIDL, there's Express Bridge Loans, there's SCORE, there's other alternative methods of tax savings and the um, employee retention credit. And so, yeah, you're you're not just filling out loan applications right now. You're having to do a a whole breadth of services is it from an ind- and it's all advising right if you're answering questions yeah. you're doing advising and and the big one that i keep hearing about is everyone wants to know how do i do cash flow protections for my clients you know how do i tell them what's going to happen where they're going to be cash wise like short term long term everyone's obsessed with that right now uh, cuz that's the question that clients have is how much money do i need well, we we touched on the PPP. Let's get into it, right? Let's get in. Let's so talk about it. Start let's, your engines. Let's do with the PPP, start, David. Start your engines. So Monday, April 27th at 10.30 a.m. Eastern, the SBA Gov is going to turn on the accept application server and... It's immediately going to crash. <laughs> that was your prediction when we were talking you know, earlier in the week, right? I, I think that could be possible. If you think back to when it first started that first day, and they're reporting out results, and there was about 5,000 here, another 2,000 an hour later, another 7,000 three hours later, the applications came in pretty slow at first. But now, my understanding is starting Thursday night or Friday, as soon as the president signed the bill, PayPal, Cabbage, Intuit, QuickBooks, all the banks... I've I got called back by two lenders, right? All the banks, everybody's getting these applications all ready to go. And before, I guess they were manually typing these applications in, but now these tech companies have it automated. They're ready to go. I mean, what what happens if PayPal sends a hundred thousand applications within two seconds? Mm-hmm. Uh, so so yeah. does this even is it still up by ten forty five a.m. Is probably the the bigger question. I'd be willing to bet twenty bucks that it goes down in the morning. So, so there's the question of whether or not it's going to stay up. How much money is in this round? So now, how much? What, what got added? It's 310 billion. It's part of a bigger fund, but which was 484 billion. But like, we just care about the PPP part, right? Um, and they're splitting it up in, in, a, in an interesting way. They're um, going to put 60 billion dollars. That's like basically spun off just for smaller lending institutions. So smaller lenders are going to be ones with 10 billion dollars or less in assets. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the rest will be the ones that have ten billion to fifty billion dollars in assets. So maybe that'll help. I guess I'm not really sure. I still have huge reservations about this program because they didn't change anything in terms of the guidance, except they put out this FAQ. Basically, is like intended to discourage 
larger companies, public companies from applying for this money, clarifying what the certification is, what, what the definition of need is or necessary is when it comes to getting these funds. Um, and, and well, let's step back for a second and talk about the whole blowback that, that occurred. Oh, right? the let's, reason let's, that this let's not go into that out. yet. Let, let, let's talk about why, what's why happening because, yeah, we can get into the uh, the bad players and getting the blowback and all that. There's definitely lots on that. But let's just get the, the maybe the rest of the facts out of the of what else is going on with the 310. Oh, sure. So, sure. so one thing with the 310 billion is that banks, based on their own internal data, think they already have all the applications. The money's gone. Like have enough applications <laughs> in queue. So um, this, right. uh, Nick Simpson, he's a spokesman with the Consumer Bankers Association. Uh, right before the House voted, he said the majority, if not all the funding Congress is considering right now is already exhausted. And an- analysts at Bank of America say that ultimately the $900 billion in aid is probably going to be needed to fund all the applications that are coming in. And now step back and like do the math on this, right? $900 billion, that's $45 billion for the banks. Mm-hmm. That they're getting fees. The last stimulus in 20, 2008, it was twice that. They got like 90 billion, the banks did in the bailout. But to do that, this government got preferred stock in the banks. Right. Now we're just paying them transaction fees. But this is, they're getting half as much money. They're being, getting half as much money and they never have to pay it back. Like they're just, it's just a gift this yeah. time. There's nothing on their well, end. You know, they have to do the paperwork, nothing. but that's it. Time. Okay. Paperwork. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, it's. I think it's it's ridiculous. It's crazy to me that we're paying the banks three five percent to hand to just just to just to do the paperwork on these loans. And, and and then of course there's the issue of like the the program is never going to have enough money because the simply the way it was set up. Um, I think actually, you know, I I don't like the big banks. Um, it, there's been a ton of blowback over this whole process against like Bank of America and Chase and City and and all the big banks uh, you know it came to light that they had a two-tier system all these banks set up a two-tier system where the retail customers the smaller customers say under in the case of Chase under 10 million dollars in assets they had to go through the online portal they instructed their retail banking staff not to help anyone personally that just to direct them to the online portal. The communication was terrible. People submitted apps. They never heard anything back. But the private clients, the commercial clients with lots of assets got concierge treatment and they got to just have their hand held through the whole thing. And that's why Chase's average loan size was over half a million dollars. They were the number one lender and they also had the biggest loans apparently. And so of course this is all- Because ultimately the law was written first and was basically the instructions were first come first serve. Well, yeah, well but- And that, never, that, w- that was never true because they stacked the application. Well, yeah, it was first come first serve as far as the SBA application process- was set up. So the SBA had to give out the loans first come first serve, but the banks were the ones submitting the applications and there was nothing in the law or the rules or guidance saying that they had to submit them in any particular order or even take them in any particular order. So of course the banks treated their existing bigger clients better. They want their clients to succeed. The big ones, they definitely want to succeed because the big ones already had loans with those banks. And uh, it's just, that's the way business works. So why would anyone expect anything else, anything otherwise? And here we are like blaming the banks for this. Well, this is the system that Congress set up. It's not the bank's fault. I mean, the banks are the way they are because they're so big. It's the system has created the banks. It's not like the banks are like, you know, you can't blame the banks for being banks. That's we like, we know they're dicks. That's like the way, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just the way it is. Yeah. So, you know, so now we're we're demonizing the banks and then we're also demonizing these public companies that took funds because the law said they could. So you have Shake Shack, you have Ruth Chris Steakhouse, you have a giant list, thousands of public companies that have now uh, taken PPP loans and you know, people are saying they have to give the money back. Um, the treasury is encouraging them to give the money back in this new FAQ. And I was curious, like, just how much of the money actually is going to public companies. And I found a site called Fact Squared that is tracking this, kind of how you are tracking PPP funds at your site, David. Which what's the URL for that? PPPstats.info, which I have to update today to get ready for the V2 distributions. <laughs> Thank you.
This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Bill.com. Through these uncertain times, one thing has become clear. Accounting firms are in a unique and trusted position to help their clients adapt. For your firm, that means leaning into the services your clients have always depended on and more. And for your clients, it means helping them move quickly to a remote model and bringing key financial processes like accounts payable online smoothly. Using Bill.com, the intelligent business payments platform, accounting firms can take a client's time-consuming manual AP process and transform it completely with automation, tracking, mobility, and transparency, easing your client's shift to working remotely and setting the stage for strategic conversations about how your firm can help them navigate the new normal. To learn more about how Bill.com can help your firm automate AP and offer client advisory services, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash bill. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash B-I-L-L. Bill.com, the intelligent business payments platform. So you're tracking how much money is going out overall. This site called Fact Squared is tracking how much money is going to public companies, which we know because they are required to disclose the loans in their public filings. And so they're going through all the SEC filings and looking for PPP loans. So far, they have counted 213 loans that went to public companies for a total value of a little over $800 million. So less than a billion dollars. And that is for 213 companies. How many of those have been returned? Seven. Seven out of the 213. Uh, so, so like nobody's returning the money. And it's not even actually so you, a big... You said that was, that was uh, $800 billion? 800, or 800 billion. I'm sorry. It's only $800 million. So like less than $1 billion of this money is going to these public companies that are getting shamed. Like it's not going to make a difference, even if they return the money. The total value of return money so far is only $65 million. This is a program that started out as a $350 billion program that has now ballooned into over $600 billion. I, I don't even know what it is right now, but it's a lot. And so like, it's all just a distraction. Blaming the public companies is a distraction. The thing that is making this program fail has nothing to do with the banks in the end, actually. I mean, it sucks that the big companies got priority because of the way the program was set up and the small guys had to wait in line. That that sucks. It was the wrong way to do it. But ultimately, what's going to cause this program to not have the effect we want is that it's so broad that everybody, virtually everybody qualifies and everybody is applying. And so the money's going to get spread out so thinly and to a, a ton of companies that don't really need the money, like who are successful, that it's just not going to have the impact. It's not going to actually save that many jobs. So we're just, it's just a giveaway. It's a giveaway. And, and there, there's an opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal. Um, title of the, uh, the article is PPP loans terms amount to a legalized fraud. Yes. And so this is a, uh, he owns a business, a food manufacturing business with 200 employees. This is an opinion piece by a guy, uh, Pete Vegas. I read this too. It's great. I'm glad you saw this. And he has he has a business and he did not have to lay off employees, but the the he agonized over getting this loan. He did take the loan. He said he put it in a separate bank account. He plans to maintain his payroll. And he understands that this loan was intended to help companies that were going to have to shut down or suffer major losses or lay their employees off. But there's nothing in the program to differentiate his company that's financially stable and a company that is operating at 50% capacity yeah. or anything, right? And so, regardless of the stimulus, his company could have probably weathered the storm, he thinks, possibly. Yeah, he's a food manufacturer. He's got plenty of work. He's an essential business. It's not getting shut down. People are buying food at grocery stores. Yeah. And under normal circumstances, this would be considered fraud. But there's no wording in the application that prohibits right. such behavior. Like Because the only thing you have to certify to, you just get the, the specific language is... Quote, current economic uncertainty makes this loan request necessary to support the ongoing operations of the applicant. And virtually any business in this economic environment can claim economic uncertainty. I mean, this guy has a food manufacturing business. He hasn't seen the economic impact hit him yet, but it could. Who knows what's going to happen in a few months? And if he deems that it is necessary to support the ongoing operations of his business, who's going to argue with him? 
So, so everybody is applying for this money. And then you've got politicians who are now saying, oh, if you apply for this money and you didn't really need it, the government's going to come down on you. Like Marco Rubio was making, I just think they're idiotic statements in that regard. Like, it, cause it's obviously not going to happen. What are you going to do? Go after 2.6 million businesses? You know, no, they're going to go maybe- after six, you know, the Shake Shacks. So they'll, they'll have some example ones and the narrative will be written like, oh, look, we went and got this money back for you. Trump's a hero or whoever went and did this, right? But that's not the reality. Like the rest of these companies, right. like you already said, they haven't returned anything. Right. And they probably won't because there's no reason to. Yeah, you there's can't- no penalty if you keep it. Yeah. Legally, they're totally in the clear, if you ask me. It would be really hard to prosecute this. So they're not going to. And there's just too many to do anyway. <laughs> It's just not going to help all that much. Like there are zero jobs that that three hundred three point four million dollar loan for this guy is is going to save. So that's just three point four million dollars that he gets for free from taxpayers. You know, is that going to stimulate the economy? I, I, who knows, right? Maybe. Well, it, it could stimulate some millionaire CEOs. Did you see <laughs> the tweet storm from uh, is uh, Judd Legum? No, I didn't see this. Uh, on Twitter. So he had uh, – apparently he runs like a newsletter or a blog site called popular.info. And he, like this other site you found, they go through all the SEC filings. So he's been going through those filings. Okay. And he's finding companies that they got their PP loan on a Monday and awarded $290,000 in cash bonuses to executives on Thursday. Jeez. Oh, God. They're going to find a ton of that. That's going to happen. I mean, this is like the hedge funds that have been rumored to be getting these loans. Like we're going to we're going to find out about those, I'm sure. And in, and he said there were, he he identified 32 companies that have paid the CEOs paid a million dollars or more. And, and then there's the whole fiasco where businesses have been getting these loans. They already furloughed or laid off all their workers, and now they want to bring the workers back, but the workers don't want to come back because they're making more from unemployment. Because now the federal government is topping up everybody's unemployment checks with an extra six hundred dollars a week, so somebody making and minimum we wage. Rumors of that, right? From yeah. accountants and bookkeepers, the previous week and a half, and now it's starting to hit national media. On you know, through, yeah. CNBC had it covered. It CNBC now. had an article called "She Got a Forgivable Loan." Her employees hate her for it. Uh, Wall Street Journal had an article, an opinion, another opinion piece called "Our Restaurants Can't Reopen Until August," which. You know, it was, it's a restaurant owner who started calling employees to say, you know, come back. And they all said, no, thanks. If they return to work, they'll have to take a pay cut. Their plan now is to stay closed until August 1st because the federal unemployment benefit ends on July 31st. Yeah. And I saw a graph in the, in an article on MSNBC to, for Washington, California, and Mississippi. And it was a graph that showed uh, how, what amount of wages you get replaced by unemployment in those states before the CARES Act and after the CARES Act and uh, based on your hourly wage. So if somebody's like a $10 an hourly wage after the CARES Act, they're, they're now making 200% more than they made before. <laughs> and this is because they just use the same amount for the whole country, right? Because in some places like New York or LA or Seattle or whatever, it's not nearly as much extra in a percentage exactly. s- situation. So, so and then the graph really, even even at the end, like if you make forty dollars an hour in Washington, you could still be making ninety percent of your wages with uh, unemployment in Washington. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, it's it, 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 I think we loosely talked about this last week, but yeah, uh, something good over here is kind of causing a different problem that was not anticipated on the other side with the PPP. It's, it's just like these programs were all just created separately, and they didn't think about the impact the they're going to have a ripple effect on each other anyway hopefully though the, at least the people who applied are going to get their money you know i mean there's still people from the first round that are waiting on their applications and waiting on money that is ridiculous to me because now what we're a full month out from the passage of the cares act and there are people from the first round of stimulus that still don't have their money and there's lots of people who haven't even gotten their individual stimulus payments yet Right, those twelve hundred dollar checks. A lot of people were supposed to get them. I think like half of the hundred and sixty million people who are going to get those, we're going to we're going to get them by direct deposit. But then it turns out that tens of millions of people used tax filing services like TurboTax, like H and R Block, like like all those services that used intermediary banks to process the refunds. So those people are not getting their money, and those are some of the poorest people. Yeah, MSNBC has a really good. Uh article 
that I don't know if you might click on it, but it's where the 881 billion in USAID went in the month of spending. And it has all these great graphs that talks that shows where this money got distributed. And if you scroll down, there's a graph about the uh, just the IRS. Yes, they've sent out 155 billion, but there's still 136 billion that has they haven't mailed yet or deposited that they're just <laughs> sitting on. So four weeks they, later, half a Half the money just has yet to get distributed. A hundred and thirty-six billion still pending. Wow, and a hundred and fifty-six has been sent. Yep. Jeez, and and that's just that one part, right? That's not yeah. what the airlines got, and what you know the the Fed lo- uh, liquidity has for the Treasury with the banks, and then um, and then obviously PPP. We're super. We talked about those num- uh, numbers plenty of times, but even the um, state and local governments apparently can tap into a, a COVID fund. And even that, there's still 54 billion left of that. Like the money's not getting out fast enough. Yeah, it's not just a matter of how much money is being allocated. It's that the the rails that we have to send this money are so ancient they're not working fast enough. It takes months to send money, basically through these you know outdated systems. We've got Etran at the SBA. We've got IRS printing paper checks. You know, China is testing a digital currency now. This is the very first government in the world. I mean, they might be the first one to actually have a digital currency using cryptocurrency that is controlled by the government. So they issued their own. Yeah. So they're testing it out. This is a Wall Street Journal story called China Rolls Out Pilot Test of Digital Currency. Last weekend, Chinese and domestic state-run media outlets reported that the trials had started in four cities, Shenzhen, Suzhou, Chengdu, and Xiangan. And uh, which is a suburb of Beijing. They've been researching this since 2014. The currency is called DCEP, which says it's a, it's a working title. It's, they don't have an official name yet, but it stands for Digital Currency Electronic Payment. And the goal is to replace cash in circulation, at least some of the cash in circulation with an app. So it's like, you know what it's like? It's like Venmo, but run by the government. But I thought they already had that with, is it, uh, what's the, what's the, the chatting app they all use in China, the WePay or WePay, WeChat, yeah. they have WeChat, WeChat yeah. which has a payment mechanism, but that's a private company. So oh, what, I guess depends on how you define private companies in China. Well, <laughs> yes. So, so the way this is going to work, here's an example in Xiangcheng, which is a district in the Eastern city of uh, Suzhou, the government will start paying civil servants half of their trans- transport subsidy in the digital currency next month as part of the city's test run. This is according to a government worker with direct knowledge of the matter that the Wall Street Journal spoke to. Government workers were told to begin installing an app on their smartphones this month into which the digital currency would be transferred. And they can transfer that money from the app into their bank accounts, or they can use it directly for transactions at merchants that accept it. So think about if we had something like this in this country. If we had a public Venmo, uh, and I didn't come up with that. That's actually a term that a New York assemblyman named Ron Kim is using for a proposal he has along with a Cornell law professor named Robert Hockett. They are proposing that we in the United States create a public Venmo. The other term that we've used for this, or I've heard about is digital dollar. And it would essentially uh, empower the Federal Reserve to open up retail banking accounts for every American citizen. The idea being that you would have an app on your phone, it's associated with your identification, and the benefit of this is uh, that the government could put stimulus money directly into your app rather than telling the IRS to print checks or rather than telling the loans or rather than telling the banks to do a loan process. I mean, imagine if- And you're talking about the same US government that I'm going to- Tell you about how the SBA had a data breach about. It's the same. We're talking about the same U.S. government here. Is this correct? Yes, this is the same U.S. government, and I know that. Yeah, but this. I mean, I don't know if China does this. Uh, well, I want to hear about this data breach, but like, I guess my argument here is that if China accomplishes this, it's going to give them so much control over their monetary policy to be able to inject stimulus directly into individuals bank accounts, essentially. It it would just be so powerful right now. It would do so much for our economy. We have a consumer economy. It's driven by consumer spending. And if people don't have money, they're not spending. And that creates a terrible cycle that can put us into a depression. So the fact that people aren't getting their money fast enough 
is the biggest problem we have right now other than people dying from COVID-19. Yeah, if you just go to the treasury website and be like, hey, here's my Venmo ID, just transfer the money there. So that way people that are not banked could possibly get the money. Like, Yeah, I definitely could see using some of those tech wallets out there to do this. But even that, it's a logistics thing because then who's left out? Are there people left out that don't have smartphones? Are there people left out that don't have one of these accounts? So it, 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 it's tricky. I, I don't know. But you know, the SBA did have a data breach during this whole thing, right? <laughs> so, so and, and I saw you shared this article or I saw it on Twitter or something and uh, somebody we both know was featured uh, in an article about it, right? In uh, Business Insider. So uh, Shana Chapman was featured in this article because she tweeted about a letter she got from the SBA, this weird generic re- letter that actually almost looked like it was a spam letter because everybody and their brother's sending out fraudulent phishing letters about PPP loans, et cetera. Mm. And it looked weird. And it basically said that 8,000 people had their loan applications breached, maybe. And But this is not a one-time thing. Five years ago, the Inspector General's office did audits of the SBA and found that they, they have longstanding security weaknesses and identified 35 open information technology audit recommendations. And three times in the last six months, they've been warned about these issues in another report that was delivered on March 30th. Well, 8,000 people, that's a lot actually given, well, it's, it's what, two point. They're going to have you know over a million loans, 1.6 million applications at this point, so 8,000. So, yeah, it's, it's quite a lot, actually. Well, especially at when that breach happened, that might have been like half the applications at that time. <laughs> like, right. So, like 8,000 out of uh, you know 800,000, right? Whatever they were that day, right? It's right. not it's not out of the full the full amount, 1.6 million now. Well, you mentioned fraud. Fraud is a big problem, and the FTC has a report out that says that total fraud loss from COVID-19 related scams has reached 19 million in the United States with 25,000 reports. And the median fraud loss is $556. So it's a lot of it is uh, fake websites. There's over 180,000 coronavirus themed sites that have been set up to steal data or misinform consumers. And a great example of that is a website that looks like the IRS site for confirming your banking information to get your stimulus payment. You go to that, it looks like it's official. It's not. You put in your social security number, your address, and all that good stuff. And then they use that information to steal your payment. I I saw the article, an article kind of from the other direction where they're they're just like, and they think it's other governments and agencies. Like the US government is giving out so much money. It's just a grab for everybody. So other countries are organized, have organized hacking efforts to just apply for these loans and create fake entities. Like if people are just trying to get this money um, and then accessing the, uh, the IRS website to try to retrieve, hey, I, I want my refund, right? Creating fake yeah. profiles, fake socials, et cetera. Um, and then it's really being exploited, that tool to check on your status of your loan. Did you hear about like landlords using it? Yeah. Because if you have the information that you, somebody would give you on a rent application, you could use that info to check their payment. And yeah. The- <laughs> And then go say, hey, Blake, I know you got your deposit from the IRS last week. You need to pay rent now. Oh, geez. Um, that's got to that's be illegal, right? I, I, no, it's illegal to ask them to, to give you sex instead of paying rent, which I understand and that is happening as well. But it's not illegal to go check on their rent payment using this tool. Uh, I, well, I, I, I don't know. Oh, Who knows, maybe. right? There's probably it, no guidance. Very it's probably <laughs> yeah. very, very great. So let's talk about some good stuff maybe. Like there's uh, – well, good I've got a good one. I've got a good one related to this. So uh, if you owe money to the IRS, they are suspending all of their collections activities. The, 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 the IRS agents have been uh, told by the director of the collections department for small business and self-employed that they're going to temporarily not collect. Uh, so y- anything, any installment agreements that were set up for between April 1st and July 15th, you can just stop making your payments on that apparently. So it's actually easier for people who like didn't properly file their taxes and pay money to get a break than it is for people to get their actual stimulus payment. You just stop making the payments. We're, we're, yeah, I, that is kind of good news, I guess, if you owe money. Right? I know, but why are we giving a break to the people who owe money right now? <laughs> right? Like, 
these are people who took probably aggressive tax positions. I don't know. I'm, I'm just I, guessing. Like, it doesn't seem like the right time to be giving a break to those folks. But I, that's I, what we're doing. I, I saw the – and I deleted the article because it didn't have to do a lot to do with business. But I did see an article about like the ultra wealthy. So, two years ago, three years ago, I think they – part of the, the Trump tax thing, they – they adjusted what uh, short-term game, long, long-term games, mm-hmm. and uh, how how much you could carry forward your losses for selling stock and things like that. And they changed that to where now it's kind of reverted and it's in your favor. So you can you can claim your your gains from last year against the major losses you just had in the stock market now. And, wow! And that's all that got shoved into these the CARES Act. Oh, and so that is the like the break that could get you millions of dollars of tax savings. Yeah, if if you, if you were, happen to have a ton of losses because you're really rich. Yes. So they, wow. they, they, they've changed that up for the, the rich, but some people are really doing things to help. So obviously now, let's say you were lucky enough to get the loan. You got to track that forgiveness, correct? Yes. So, and we'll put these in the show notes, but there's three things that are, I found are kind of helpful. So one is a, there's a, a blog post on accounting web. It's how to do the bookkeeping part one and how to properly record a PPP loan. And this article breaks down from, here's how you create a bank account in QuickBooks to do it all the way through um, creating a new bank account right at the bank and tracking your expenses separately and, and how you want to bucket them in. So there's a good article on that. And then Jacob Schroeder, uh, listen, two listeners actually tweeted this out. So uh, two different spreadsheets, so, or sorry, Google Sheets uh, that basically you can use to track your um, PPP tracking. So they're, they're Google Sheet templates. One's uh, from Jacob Schroeder on Extend Consulting and the other one's from Matthew May of Acuity. So two listeners tweeted out Google Sheets that could be very helpful for all of you. Those are great resources and like perfect examples of marketing that is like really effective in this time. These, these Google Sheets are getting shared all over the internet and their logo is right there and a link to their website. And it's perfect. It's exactly what you want to be doing. So what should we talk about next? Do you want to talk about layoffs? <laughs> I know you wanted to talk about like upbeat uh, stuff, but... We could talk uh, the, 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 just a little bit more stimulus stuff, and then we'll talk about layoffs. Um, but this is like app news. Okay. So, so, do you want, let's, should, we, should, we, should, we, should we switch to app news now? Yeah, let's switch to app news then. What, what is new in the world of apps? New, new. So there's kind of two chunks here. One is... Tons of tech players are now jumping into the helping small businesses, right? And I think we talked a little bit before about the small business relief campaign with Intuit and GoFundMe, uh, the Pay Today, which is like paytoday.club. And essentially, it's about, hey, if you owe a small business money, pay them. So that's Funbox, Homebase, Gusto are involved in that. Now, Yeah, um, I mean, that's really, you know, it's nice and cute and stuff, but it's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, American <laughs> Express and about 40 other apps all came together for uh, hashtag stand for small. Um, even Melio is doing that as well. Uh, PayPal is waiving. Now, this isn't small businesses much, but if you need to cash your stimulus check, you can do it through PayPal and not pay a fee. And the two interesting ones is Facebook has created a $100 million grant program. For what? And uh, For small businesses. Like what, are they, what do you mean? So, like they're giving money to small so, businesses? Yeah. So you just uh, – A, you have to be a business that has between 2 and 50 employees. The second part is you have to have been operating within a year – or I'm sorry – a minimum of one year. And then the only other thing, and it's very left, very loose, the word challenges. So if your business is experiencing challenges, quote unquote, due to the COVID-19 outbreak. Oh, so it's it's just as loose a definition as the SBA program. So virtually anyone can qualify for this. Yeah. But you have to uh, say what you're going to use the money for. Oh, okay. Right? Like, hey, uh, I'm essential because I'm going to, I maybe I'm a distillery and I'm going to make a hand sanitizer, whatever it is, right? You're going to say what you used it for. So they're doing that. And then also, and this will be in the show notes, the links to the, is for this one as well. Salesforce is start is going to give out $10,000 grants. And it's just about as loose. So, <laughs> so if you're, if you're getting, if you're getting denied from the federal government, there's big tech companies that are offering grants as well. So I've only got one app news story to talk about, and it's kind of weird. It's this email from Expensify. Did you get this email? Yes. So I love the emails that come from the CEO, David Barrett. They're always like long, but very like interesting. They're the only product announcement emails that I will like read in detail and not just skim over because he generally talks a lot about what's going on at the company. It's really interesting. And and what I like about his emails, it's almost like you're getting a glimpse into their decision-making process in his brain a little bit. And he, he write the, you're right. They're a very long email, but he, he kind of leads you on, leads you on the journey yeah. to 
the final decision they make towards the end of the email. So, so this week I was kind of busy. So I kind of just stuck that email in my read later folder and I was going to come back to it. And then I saw all this like discussion happening online, people like upset at Expensify, which, you know, I'm not used to. <laughs> and I'm, I'm wondering what is going on. So then I go and I read the email and it's actually kind of hard to figure out what is going on. It's like uh, David is talking about how they have this concierge service and they've been investing in customer support and that, but the COVID-19 pandemic has like just crushed their revenues. And so in a very like long way, it gets around as saying they're going to like change the pricing, but then it's not really clear to me from reading the email, what the actual change is going to be. And I think this really rubbed a lot of people the wrong way during this time. Because I think, I, I think so. I saw somebody tweet about it. It kind of is like, Hey, we know we have not given good customer service, but now we're going to start. We've improved it. So now we're giving you more customer service. But oh, guess what? Feel sorry for us because, and I'm summarizing like the tweet, right? Like, like vibe here, right? Oh, feel sorry for us because guess what? Nobody's doing any business travel and we're losing money like crazy. And you should feel sorry for us. And now we're going to raise prices. And it, it just, it, it, it kind of read like that to a lot of people. Well, and, I haven't seen any price increases. So like this is the only company that I've seen doing a price increase at this time. And I think there's kind of been sort of a general understanding that like people just aren't doing it. And uh, accounting firms definitely are not. And they're actually doing a lot of free work for clients. So I think this is that's part of the problem here. So here's what actually is changing. Because I, I had to go to the website to really get clarity on this. So what they are doing is... If you move 50% or more of your company's approved monthly spend to the Expensify card, which is that new credit card that Expensify has issued, it's like a charge card, like what Brex and uh, I don't know, what are these other companies that do this? Uh, Divi does it and there's, there's a, lots of them. Yeah. yeah so the, basically the, those companies came out with their cards. So Expensify created a card uh, you know, and Expensify is saying if you move your expenses off of your personal or company cards and you use the Expensify card for more than 50%. Thomas, you cannot be in here right now, but I want to tell you something. Mommy needs to go pee. Oh, mommy needs to go pee. <laughs> yeah. She can go in your bathroom, bud. Okay, bye. <laughs> That's awesome. You have to save that. You have to clip that out and put it in his memory box. Um, where was I? Uh, the fifty uh, percent of your users yeah. on the new card. So if you put you know fifty percent of your expenses on the card, then your fee's not going to go up. But if you don't then there's going to be an unbundling fee on a sliding scale. So if like 35% of your spend for the month is on the card, then you're going to get charged for 30% of the unbundling fee. And then there's like the, the so basically the price is doubling for the subscription per user. And it's going to gradually increase over the next 12 months. But like this is a con this cal calculation. <laughs> I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know what the price is going to be. And I feel like a lot of people are frustrated. And I don't know, like, was this really necessary? Yeah, the, uh, the timing is a little weird, right? And because most fintech companies right now are giving away free subscriptions, free discounts, right? They're, they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're trying to help all the small businesses. I'm not saying that Spencify is not trying to help. Um, but it's also interesting because if they're going to, obviously, there's competition, right? You have the Divis, the Brexes, those types of products that are out there where they're not charging anybody to use those products. There's no fees. They're right, free. Right. And Expensify was always free, but those companies are really where they're making their money is on the... Um, they they get some money every time somebody uses the their built-in credit card. The interchange. The interchange. Yeah. And so, if if they're going to encourage people to use the Expensify card, those should be free then, Right. So it almost yeah. feels like the, it, this is, a, this is a, a business model change to like, hey, we're going to be more like Brex and Divi a little bit is what it kind of sounds like. But sort or of like half we, halfway. Yeah, it's it's weird. But you can still um, use your old one. We're just going to charge you to yeah. do the old way. Yeah. So it's it's confusing. It's it's weird. It's just, uh, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> But I've heard it would have been better to rip off the band aid and just be like, hey, we're not, we're going to, you have to get the Expensify card to stay on Expensify or just that's it. Or, or is that kind of dangerous? Cause then people go, like, well, I'll just check the whole market for tons of different solutions now. Yeah. I don't know. I definitely wouldn't have raised, I would have figured out a way not to raise prices. I mean, if you need to take on more capital to get through this. And part of the problem, I think, is that Expensify always charge for active users, which a lot of companies don't. They'll just charge you for every, 
email address that has an account on your in your company. But with Expensify, one of the things I loved about it as an accountant is that I could put my clients on it. And if they didn't use it, I didn't pay for them. But that's a big danger to Expensify in a downturn because then a bunch of users stop using it. They don't submit expense reports that month. And then Expensify doesn't collect any fees. Yeah, especially as you go up market into bigger companies, right? Yep. Uh, a smaller company, a small business owner, they're still going to have expenses they still have kind of on a day-to-day basis. They might not be doing travel, yep. but like I think corporate travel is 100% stopped right now. Well, uh, David, that's all I've really got uh, today. Oh, there was that one thing I wanted to talk about, the uh, the layoffs. So real quick, uh, you know, like, I don't want to talk about specific layoffs, just like more are happening. Like we've all heard about them. And Ed Mendelowitz wrote an article on accounting today. I think it's a kind of a funny topic. I mean, I guess it's helpful for partners, but it's it's an article called Deciding Who to Let Go. And it's how do you de- it's a list of things to consider when you decide who you're going to fire in your firm. 19 things. Yeah, I guess if you got to do it, right? This is this is a helpful list. And this this is a satirical or is this No, this is for real. It's not a joke. For real. Okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, he's okay. actually like, you know. Here's some tips. And and, okay. and what I like about Ed is um you know, Mr. Menlowitz, as I should probably call him, is that uh, he's, you know, like he's old school, but like good old school. Like, you know, if you want to run your firm old school, you got to listen to this guy. I, I like him. I, I've been listening to his podcast. Yeah, no, it's uh, good. The stuff on like sales and firm development and market, it's all really good. Like especially the tax update stuff, stuff yeah. is good that he does. You actually, because you're in Phoenix, he's in Phoenix. Oh yeah. <laughs> somehow you guys should do a six, you should go get, meet each other, stay six feet away and chat it. It would be great. Well, so there's only one thing I wanted to say about this. Uh, okay. It's a great list of things to think about. Um, I'll just read some of them, okay? So here's what you should consider when you're thinking about like who to let go. How well do they follow your instructions? Are they learning from each new job so that the third time they do similar work, they don't need instruction? Do they apply what they learned on one project to another or from working on one client to the next? Do they remember what they worked on so they can apply it if it comes up again, either on that client or somewhere else? Do they meet deadlines without constant prodding? Do they take ownership? Do they follow up diligently? Can they handle multiple projects? Do they work relatively air-free? Do they ask for help when they need it? Are they self-starters? That's just a few of them, right? They're all great. And as I'm reading this list, I'm thinking, you know what is not on this list here? Timesheets and utilization. The only item that is even related to that is the last one, which is do they help you make more money? But notice how none of these things are about how many hours they're billing and how, you know, what percentage they're utilized. It's, it's irrelevant to this decision, which makes me wonder why do we track it at all for performance purposes? If you're not going to fire people based on it, then why track it? But I I think I brought this up two weeks ago, three weeks ago. That's how they determine the layoffs is by your billable hours and your utilization. Well, they they, They justify the layoffs with that, but that is not why they actually get rid of you. That's my argument. Hmm. They get rid of you for all these reasons. Like, are you easy to work with? Are you a self-starter? All of that. Because that's what determines both, you know, how well you work with people at the firm and how well you work with clients. But the actual, like, time entries, like, that's not what... That's just a consequence of all of this. Does that make sense? That's true. Because they're going to give you less work to do. They're going to... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And that's what's it's happening right now. Of these 19. That's what's happening now with big firms is, like, you're working from home and you're seeing your hours drop. And that just because people aren't giving you work because they don't want to work with you. So like, that's what gets you fired. But you know, it's not, it's not, not having the hours that gets you fired. It's the thing that happens before that, which is people don't want to give you work. So that's all I got this week. I think that's it for me as well. So Blake, if people want to, um, actually a couple of things people need to know about, we're still, um, doing the reviews for good promotion. So if you go to podchaser.com, you can leave a review on the cloud accounting podcast and they will make a donation to meals on wheels who are donating meals to the elderly. And if, if Blake and I reply to your review that you leave there, they'll double the amount that's donated, which is very exciting. And then we have our voicemail. Yeah. If you, you want to call us, if you want to leave us a message, we will take a listen. We will play it on the air potentially. It is 202-695-1040. That is 202-695-1040. We hope to hear from you. I've also been getting some emails. I don't have time today to to read through them, but I'm going to remember next time we're going to read through some of this listener mail. Uh, and if you want to send me an email or otherwise contact me, you can reach me at blake at blakeoliver.com or on Twitter at Blake T. Oliver. How about you, David? 
I am on Twitter at David Leary. And if you want to find me on LinkedIn, I'm at David Leary as well. But I'm going to ask now when people contact me on LinkedIn to say like, I listen to the podcast because I, I'm just, I feel like I'm just having a conversation with robots on LinkedIn. There's, I think a lot of people are using like this automation software that just sends messages to prospect. It's just sales stuff. Yeah. I don't know. So, so what I do is I just reply back, you'll love this podcast. And then I give them a link to subscribe <laughs> over and over again. But then they reply back. And then after like the third time I realize, oh, I've already replied this same message to this person three times, but obviously they're not reading it. So that's how yeah. I figure out it's a bot. It's a bot. Um, we'll, we'll get there. Well, uh, have a great rest of your weekend, David. And Yeah. And, and hopefully PPP V2 goes so smoothly on Monday, we don't have to get together and do a show. Like, uh, like, I, I hope yeah. it just goes smoothly. I hope it does. Like we can't. Nobody has the energy for this. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Talk to you later. That's a wrap. Bye. Right, bye. Time for the classifieds. Have you heard about the Virtual Cloud Accounting Summit hosted by Jetpack Workflow? It takes place on April 30th, is 100% free, and offers you the ability to take advantage of over $6,000 in exclusive software discounts. Speakers include Ron Baker, Mike Michalowicz, Jackie Meyer, Jody Gruden, and more. To reserve your free spot, head over to go.jetpackworkflow.com slash cloud accounting summit. If you want to learn how to make video tutorials from an expert, sign up for Hector Garcia's live webinar, How to Make Video Tutorials, so you can learn how to create content to educate your team, your clients, and your prospects. Use coupon code CAP50 for $50 off your purchase. Head over to www.hectorgarcia.com slash tutorial. Still sending spreadsheets of unclassified expenses to clients? Automate this process and get client answers instantly with Client Hub's QuickBooks Online integration. This feature was described as one that only an accountant would have come up with, as it solves a real big pain point. Client Hub is a modern client portal designed for cloud accounting firms. Get started today with a free trial at clienthub.app and enter promo code CAP25 for 25% off your first three months. Are you looking to get some of the best content in the world to improve your team and your firm and some free CPA credits too? Good news. The Accounting Salon has turned into a virtual event called Salon V and it's open to the world. You can register for free at accountingsalon.com. Want to get the word out about your newsletter, webinar, party, Facebook group, podcast, ebook, job posting, or that fancy Excel macro you just created? Why not let the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast know by running a classified ad? Hit the show notes for the link to get more info, and be sure to check out our special stimulus pricing of four episodes for just $100.